Yes, so welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining the latest in the series of the NGCDI thought leadership calls. <clears throat> I think probably in the rhythm of it, most people know about the next generation converged digital infrastructure project. Um, and we're very pleased to <clears throat> um, welcome Philip Stiles from the Judge Business School, which you can see um, in the leafy picture behind you. <laughs> um, uh, Philip is Senior Lecturer in Corporate Governance and Co-Director of the Centre for International HR Management. Um, and when we are looking for our ambition of uh, running a very largely software oriented infrastructure for services, um, that will of course involve uh, self-learning, autonomics, AI, uh, which is a huge technical technological change, but equally it's a change to the human beings and the organisation they work in. Uh, and I would argue the more important half in many ways. So uh, Philip, who's interested in human capital, social and organisational capital, has been carrying out on behalf of the project a look into the, the culture and um, sort of human impacts and things that we need to think about as we move into that, that brave new world. So without more ado, over to Philip um, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on the chat for any questions and please at the end uh, do come forward with with questions and put some in the chat as, you, as we go, if anything strikes you. Philip, over to you. Uh, thanks a million, Stephen, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining the call. It's uh, it's great to see you. Um, thanks, Stephen, for the introduction. Um, as Steve mentioned, we're looking, I, my colleagues, Eleanor, Pradeep and myself, we're looking at issues around organisational um, effects of the introduction of automation, um, how, does, how does risk and governance match the introduction of automation um, that you know that's been characterized by by some of the projects in NGCDI and what I thought we might do today in this session is just really highlight some of the issues around risk and governance particularly the issue of dynamic risk and governance and look at three themes and really just use this as a way to continue a debate that has been going on uh, within the project now for several years and was which culminated um, at the Spotlight event, which I know many of you were at um, a few weeks ago, where we had a, a couple of round tables and some really interesting discussion. So we'd like to just just um, you, you know use this as a way to just present some ideas and also to get some feedback from you, if we can, uh, either on the chat or in the question and answers at the end. Um, so Stephen said, I work at Joe's Business School in Cambridge, uh, along with my colleagues. And um, why don't I just uh, just jump ahead and just give you maybe the three themes we want to look at today. <clears throat> so we just wanted to present them in, in, in a sense, fairly provocative statements, and um, which I hope you, you, know, you may have a view about, and let's just use this opportunity just to, just to share some ideas. The first, the first thought would be that automation is the future, but people frame it differently. And um, you know, the kind of direction of travel is very clear but how are we seeing that playing out in the organization, particularly in terms of mindsets? A second point, I guess, would be um, the famous phrase that gets used all the time, that um, culture eats strategy for breakfast, uh, and uh, made famous by Peter Drucker. Um, and indeed, it came up at the Spotlight events. Uh, a couple of people said that, made that quote. Um, and what I want to say here, I guess, is that culture doesn't always eat strategy or, or, or structure come to that for breakfast. Um, there are organizations where that doesn't happen. And we want to highlight what, the, what that might mean for BT and, and NGCDI and, and um, automation and autonomic networks and so on. And third point, I guess, is stop, you know, um, we should stop talking about risk to make risk management better. And uh, the same would pretty much go for governance as well, that we want to think about the language that we're using here and to think, you know, how is this, how is this talk about risk and structures about risk, like risk committees and risk, um, you, know, uh, you know, group risk officers and so on. Is this helping us? Is this helping us? Or actually, is this making things worse? And, you know, on the face of it, it looks like it's making things worse. So how can we just get that better? OK, so those are the three thoughts we want just to pursue. Um, and through this, we'll just give you some of the research that we've been uh, focusing on. And just drop that in as we go through. OK, so. Um, just a quick word about research. <laughs> so Eleanor, Pradeep and, and myself, again, I won't go through this exhaustively. I think many of you know how we're trying to conduct this, but in, in essence, we've looked at thought leaders 
um, across the you know across you know, the the industries um, around risk and governance. We've also looked at chief risk officers. We've looked at a range of firms uh, in terms of use cases. Some of which um, are here. These are the ones we can name. Some of this, some we can't name right now, but um, these are some names um, which I'm sure are pretty familiar to you. And I guess we try to look at use cases which have a at least you know a, a kind of more than a passing resemblance to BT in terms of their their complexity, their regulatory status, their um, their need for very reliable um, and strong you know and strong governance uh, systems in place, and so those that these are the kind of organisations we've looked at. And again, as we go through, I'll I'll I'll, I'll drop in some examples, and you can see um, where the similarities might be. Before we just launch into to all that, can can we just pause just for one second? Um, just to kind of put our put our heads into this space a little bit, um, I just wanted to think again, not for comment or any feedback, but just just to kind of orient ourselves a little bit. Um, just think what just think about two risks you've taken today. Think about two risks you've taken today. Just think that. Just again, no need to come on chat. If you want to come on chat, of course you can. Um, or if you want to come off, you know, just come off mute. Come come off mute, but. Just think about two risks you've taken today. Could be at home, could be, could be when you came to work, could be at work. Um, just think, you know, from eight, you know, from seven o'clock in the morning right till now, one o'clock. What risks have you taken? Okay. I imagine if you know if you engage in that that little thought experiment, I imagine. You probably come up with more than two risks, and I think if I asked you about the last month, um, you know, it wouldn't be difficult for you to come up with examples of that. And one one kind of question we're trying to to to, to look at in our research is, you know, what does this mean for us? You know, most of us are not in risk departments. Um, I know one or two of two of us in the room are, um, but most of us are not in risk departments. Most of us don't have risk in our titles. Nevertheless, we're operating with risk all the time. How happy are we with how these things are arranged? Um, how happy are we with our sense making of these issues? These are some of the kind of difficult things that we're going to try and look at. Um, not necessarily all of this session, but just to touch on those a little bit later. And when you when you sort of aggregate your own individual risks with the risk of everyone else in the organisation, some of some of them, of course, will be trivial, and some of them will be you know will only matter to you. Um, some of them may be at least partly crossing boundaries. Some of them may be crossing a number of boundaries. And in a way, part of our issue that we're facing with our research is just to figure out what that means for an organization like BT. Um, and how might we think about that better in terms of how we classify these things, how we coordinate these things, how we mitigate some of these things and so on. Okay, So just to give you that sense, just to put us into the space a little bit, first big, Provocation, I guess, is you know automation is the future. Well, people frame it differently. Okay, people frame it differently. So um, maybe just to start here. So a couple of quotes. As I mentioned, we had the um, the spotlight event, which was organised um, by Stephen and colleagues and Paul and and others and Sarah, of course, um, recently at Ad Astral. Um, and I know many of you attended that event. And we had um, we had two sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, to talk about on the first day to talk about um, you know various things within the NGCDI uh, portfolio. And one one of the tables, luckily, was was for us was risk and governance. And many of you at attended that that table either in the morning or the afternoon. There were some very rich quotations that we had. And just to give you a flavour of the automation piece, here are a couple of quotes. Okay, so automation is good in parts. We shouldn't automate all of the core network, otherwise we will lose ownership. Just to balance that quotation, um, automation is the right way, but automation in critical national infrastructure is not well accepted. Not well accepted. And that not well accepted tended to was seen in both ways, either either internally or maybe even from the customer point of view. Okay, so there's a sense in which. You know, automation obviously is a, is a is important for the firm, um, 
but how are we how are we implementing it? So this is a slide we took from Azahar. Azahar gave a talk to uh, NGCDI um, last year, which is uh, very, very uh, helpful for us. I think and when we think about this, um, well, you know, he's looking, he and his team were looking at the issue around um, the idea around uh, how automation may play out, you know, in terms of the firm, in terms of, um, in terms of the customer base, in terms of the community, how might this play out? How might this play out? And um, and I think again, you see some of the issues around, you know, the workforce, how, how the structure may be, what kind of skills may be necessary, and so on. And it's a very kind of useful help, you know, diagram to, to kind of consider. And when we think about automation and BT strategy, it's kind of clear where you're headed. Um, when we think here. When we're doing our research, particularly with our use cases, obviously there's a lot of things going on in organizations generally. One way to look at it is to think about these three kind of wheels going round. Um, one is the strategy wheel. So in other words, where are we headed? And on the left-hand side, again, just brief detail, two basic kinds of strategy, corporate strategy, business strategy. In other words, corporate strategy, what business, you know, what business are we in? What kind of portfolio do we have? And business strategy, how do we compete within those, those choices that we make? And there are risk elements that we can use to manage all of that. So again, I won't go through all those, but you can just see those notes on, on, the, on the slide. Then, of course, we have a finance wheel, which is, in other words, what can we afford? Or what, where are we going to place our bets and what investment are we going to have? And, and again, you know, we may want, we want everything with strategy, but, you know, the finance, the finance issue will 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 constrain us, um, and so therefore we have to kind of balance those two wheels. And the third wheel, of course, is the service level we want to to offer. And we put it sort of bigger here because you know one of the themes of NGCDI, of course, is about service and service assurance, and obviously very very important for us. And when we think about service, you know what what can we offer? What do we want to offer that will be consistent with our strategy, consistent with values? And that we can afford. So <clears throat> this is just really context setting. All we're trying to say here is there are obviously trade-offs between these things. And one of the things we're looking at is in terms of risk and governance is, you know, where are we, where are we adjusting here? The other thing, of course, underlying all this is time scale. For example, how long in terms of the strategy are we looking? Um, how far out are we looking? What difference will that make for investment? And so forth. And so forth. So that's the kind of context we're offering, we're, we're operating in. How are we making these, these trade-offs? Okay, so straightforward, I hope. One of the big things, I guess, with, with automation is, is, is the kind of, in a way, and obviously with risk and governance too, there's a, there's a kind of relentless focus on the negative, which is understandable, because that's where most, when one hears the word, risk and governance and, and so on, and automation come to that. We sometimes think of these things in a way which might be negative. And of course, there's a very good reason for that, because often there are negative consequences. Um, of course, you know, to look at risk generally, we have to look at three basic buckets of risk. One, of course, is the downside risk. You know, what will happen? What is, you know, what will happen if there are mistakes, if there's a crisis? And so, you know, the usual traditional way of thinking about risk. In the middle is the external risk piece, which is really, um, you know, what is the external market or the external environment throwing up at us that, you know, will affect how we operate, you know, usual examples of, you know, COVID and, and Brexit and so on and so on and all, all, the, all the usual examples, but, you know, how are we responding to those and how, are we seeing those well in advance? The upside risk, of course, sometimes tends to be neglected. And I think, here, I think for particularly for for the work we're doing in NGCDI and the whole you know the whole issue about the automation and autonomics and so on. I mean, just highlighted highlighted the upside risks. You know, it would you know, BT will become a digital company. There'll be more scale, more stability, culture of experiments. You'll be able to review practices better with with you know the introduction of of um, the new network. Customer response should go up. Delivery of new service offerings should be better, and so on, and so on. 
but it's obviously a balance here. And we, you know, and obviously people see these things with different frames. So when we think about automation <clears throat> and we think about risk and governance, we have to kind of think about how those things play out in people's minds, okay? which will take us onto the issue of culture a little bit later. Just to give you a sense of that, so moving away, say, from our research and say, taking a look at, say, uh, at EY. So EY did a recent survey of the top risk in telcos. Um, and these were the five they, they come up with. They came up with, these were the top five of these. They, were, they had about 10, 15 overall, but the top five of these. Failure to um, ensure infrastructure, reach and resilience, number one. Number two, underestimating changing imperatives in privacy, security and trust. Number three, failure to redesign workforce structure and skill sets. Number four, failure to mitigate supply chain disruption. And number five, poor management of, sustainable, of the sustainability agenda. Okay, so, so when you look at data like this, um, I think what's interesting, obviously, is if you take the top three of those, failure to ensure infrastructure reach and resilience. <clears throat> And again, you know, obviously this, the NGCDI product, uh, project is, 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 you know, is firmly in, in that space to see how can we scale, how can we build a network that is very resilient and so on. So you see the upside risk of that. Um, secondly, underestimating changing imperatives in privacy, security and trust. Um, and again, of course, that's a huge open debate. One word we'd focus on there for us, particularly culture-wise, is trust. We'll come back to that. Third, failure to redesign work, uh, workforce structure and skill sets. And when you see similar surveys to this, you see the same, that comes up again and again and again. And in a way, that's one of the things that we, as part of the NGCDI um, portfolio, are very interested in, in terms of the future workforce, the future of work itself, where work will be done and so on. Again, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Okay. Again, at any point, just tell me to stop and we can stop on any of these slides or just come on chat. If any of these, you know, you find objectionable, or you just want to challenge or just want to comment on, please do, please do. Um, so automation seems to be the future, is the future, with good reason, because there's lots of upside risk. But there are different narratives playing out. That's theme one. Here's some more quotations from the Spotlight event last month. Um, automation can bring scalability and better service offerings. Good. Two, we have to address customers who are nervous about automation. Okay, that point was made more than once uh, on these. And by the way, with all these quotations, just remember this is a small sample and they're only, these are only illustrative quotations. Okay, just to obviously just to say that as a health warning. But nevertheless, I, I try to we try to use quotations where you know more than one person would say these things. Third, we have to get beyond the narrative of cost maximization and of automation as a means of getting rid of people. Okay, so again, that's a theme which emerged and you know, of course, is not specific to BT. That's a, it's a general theme across industries. You know, is, there a, is there an agenda to use automation in that way? So when we think about you know, the, the future for BT and the future for, for the network and how we're going to move there, um, there's something here about the narratives which we just have to think about and maybe adjust or reframe or align and see how we might work with that. So that's really theme one. Okay. So automation is the future, but people frame it differently. Okay, good, good. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Again, jot down any questions, come, come back at me, come back at this at any point. Um, second theme, culture doesn't always eat strategy and structure for breakfast. Okay. Meaning, the original meaning of the phrase culture eats strategy for breakfast, I mean, it's kind of obvious meaning, but what it was intended to, to signal was no matter what strategy you try to implement, culture will always kind of override it and defeat it unless, unless you work very, very hard at making the culture work and align with strategy, unless you can do that. Similarly for structure, 
no matter what structure you put in place, the culture will override it because culture will always win out. This culture is very strong. Plus, you can see structure and you can see strategy, but you can't see the culture, essentially. You know, actually, I'll, come, I'll qualify that statement in a bit. Fine, everyone knows that. Everyone knows culture is tricky. And however, certain organizations do make it work, okay? Particularly, particularly in the circumstances that BT are facing right now. All right, so let me, let me explain what that might mean, okay? Um, first of all, before I get into the culture bit, I wanna get into the structure bit. NGCDI is a, is a particularly for, for, the, for, the, for the work we're doing, the organizational work we're doing in NGCDI, um, is really a kind of game with two halves. Really. First half is really about structure. So all colleagues in NGCDI are doing some fantastic work around some very, very technical areas. And what we're trying to do is to see how that maps onto the risk and governance structures in organizations and how that might align and make sure that the organization can move forward both in terms of the structure of the place and also the culture of the place. So to give you a flavor of that, um, if you think about the very top of an organization, we're thinking about the issue of intent. Now, I know many of you attended the, the Spotlight event and attended the, atten the intent table. Um, and of course, you know, we on the project have had many, many fruitful discussions with colleagues talking about intent. At the very top is what we call corporate and business intent. Corporate meaning, you know, what does the organization ultimately want for itself in terms of a portfolio of, of, of businesses? Um, and secondly, the business intent, given we have you know, a particular business, whatever that might be, network or television or whatever it might be, we have a business intent. In other words, that's what we're trying to do in this business. We all know that. To help with that in terms of risk and governance, we have an enterprise risk and a governance risk set up. Okay. In most organizations of BT size, it would be called enterprise risk management or framework of enterprise risk management. Um, and in, the, in, the, um, in, our, in our project, Overall, um, the work on digital twins, which which my, which Rob from Bristol will talk about uh, in the next um, thought leadership piece, and the simulation that Cambridge is developing, um, would be would be examples of, of ways to which in which we might think about controlling or assessing risk at that kind of level. Okay, at that kind of level. Second level down, we have service intent. In other words, once we decided what we want to do in our business. Um, what kind of service are we going to deliver? Oh, no, let me, what service do we intend to be more specific? Okay, we'll get to delivery in a minute. This is what we want, we think we should be delivering to our clients or our customers, okay? Here we have to consider operational risk. And again, in terms of the project, just because I know many of you are very familiar with our projects, um, you know, when we think about, um, the intent work that many of our colleagues are doing, um, you know, particularly um, Ning and Surrey and, 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 and you know, in, in Cambridge and Bristol and so on, and, and Lancaster too, you know, the many people involved in the intent piece. And very crudely, you know, you can think about intent from a custom point of view and an operator point of view. Those things are, you know, we're looking at those things in the, in the project to see how those link on to those risk and intent um, uh, uh, kind of concepts and, and, and structures. Third thing, apart, you know, one level down from the intent, of course, is the development. And here we have, you know, what we call, say, the model risk part of it. In other words, how are we designing these things? How are we designing these, these models or frames or, or um, approaches to, you know, to mapping the world and to mapping the customer interactions and so on? Um, and here, Harris, you know, with DevOps and, and um, and also the TMF work in terms of um, model risk, you know, all very, very nice and very solid pieces of work to kind of analyze, analyze those pieces. And the last issue is the service delivery. In other words, once all the models have, have been validated and out in the, into the world and we're delivering, um, what could go wrong? You know, what is, or what could go right? What is the service risk here? And again, a number of colleagues in the NGCDI, you know, looking at, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, of course, um, prediction, um, you know, 
predictive maintenance, anomaly detection, um, you know, control activities, uh, routing, you know, these kinds of big issues, you know, colleagues, again, colleagues from all over the project, Cambridge, you know, Bristol, Lancaster, Surrey, involved in these, in these issues. So in a way, the project is trying to, 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 to look at how the technical piece can link to the risk piece and then back into the intent piece. Okay, that's the general direction, general direction. There are obviously lots of governance models out there. I could put up you know, dozens here, but this might just suffice. Again, I won't go through it. Obviously, to, you know, you see many of these kind of diagrams, I'm sure. But ultimately, what these, what these diagrams show is a hierarchy of boards and committees and supervisory elements and and you know they, they exist at a kind of enterprise level what we call you know the enterprise risk or enterprise governance and then they kind of filter down much more into kind of regional business unit or model risk and so on and there's a there's a kind of big connection between these things and that i guess is meant to make us feel safe and protected and reassured but you know that some people are getting on with this stuff. Some people are looking after the risks, some people are looking after the structure, some people are looking after the governance, and we're kind of okay, right? We're okay. That is a very, very traditional way of thinking about it. Very traditional way. And I know Ben um, Cataneo in, in Group Risk is thinking a very different way about it, and all, not all, but some other people, which we'll get to in a little while, are also thinking a very different way about this. So the NGCDI work is, is fantastic. But what's difficult about, about this is often we try and overlay traditional risk, traditional governance mechanisms onto, say, some of the work on NGCDI. And it's not going to fit. It's not going to fit. So we need to think about a different way of doing it. Okay. And the reasons, I'll come to the reasons why it's not going to fit in a second. But just to say at the moment, that's a traditional way of looking at it. What well, NGCDI and the whole the whole project that BT is undertaking in terms of the net the core network requires something else. something else. Let me just give you a flavor of that, just to give you a sense of it. This is from EY uh, last year, looking at um, issues in, in telecoms companies. And what were some of the big features of some of the response responses here? These are chief executives of telecoms companies. Um, and essentially what they're saying here pretty much is these, these chief executives, they want a different structure. They want a different structure. So they want, in, you know, they want to enable business functions to operate uh, as an internal ecosystem rather than any sort of silo or, or kind of rigidly structural um, way of working. Um, similar vein. Um, Implement more agile decision-making process. You hear that phrase all the time. Um, how often do you see it? I know in BT you have you have you have agile ways of working, for sure. Can we? I mean, maybe one thing for our question and answer a bit later. Can we? Can we institutionalize those in in areas where you don't feel they are operating? Um, Create smaller, more autonomous organizational units. Implement an organizational structure with less hierarchy. Okay. In the in the spotlight event, we came across similar, similar points of view. Points of view. So what can we do about this? Just a couple of thoughts. Um, one is to kind of go back in time a little bit and look at the what we call the HROs, the high reliability organizations. High reliability organizations are organizations which essentially can't fail. They're not, they can't, they're not allowed to fail. The examples on the left, nuclear power plant, air, airport, you know, air traffic control, um, hospitals. Any failures can be catastrophic. BT would come into this, this category. Some these organizations tend to tend to be able to find a way to have a hierarchy, but also subvert the hierarchy. And the research done by Ken Sutcliffe and, and many others following them, but I just thought I'd give you the, the locus classicus, you know, where all this kind of started. Um, 
These are the kind of core elements, the core characteristics of high reliability organization. Number one, a preoccupation with failure. Um, small failures must be, must be noticed. Okay. Number two, a re reluctance to simplify. One of the big problems, as we all know, is that people tend not to see the system in an organization. And they think that often, you know, a risk or a mistake or something which emerges is the fault of one person or two people. And there's a kind of blame culture attached to that. When actually often the, the risk or the mistake or whatever it might be, is the fault of, you know, some kind of systemic issue. So the reluctance to simplify is important. Third, sensitivity to operations, meaning <clears throat> the very top, Top echelons of the organization are, are very, very familiar with the you know, people at the front line. Uh, very important point. So seventh, sensitivity to operations. Fourth, um, commitment to resilience. The ability to bounce back. This is very much um, not, not only a system issue, but a leadership issue. And last but not least, deference to expertise. In other words, people should be empowered all the way down the line. Um, particularly, particularly when we have when we're confronted with a crisis or a big issue, we can't keep going up and down the chain. People have to be have to be empowered on the ground quickly, quickly. Now, I know from some of the comments at the Spotlight event, um, that seems to happen in BT, which is great. Um, can we do it more? I guess would be the call. Classic example: um, the original the original piece of research was an aircraft carriers. I won't go through all the research, obviously. Uh, it's by um, by Laporte and Concioli, but but just to give you a sense of what they found on that on the aircraft carrier. So obviously, an aircraft carrier is a military operation, and what they found were three kind of tempos. One was routine, one was high tempo, the third was emergency. In routine operations, they would have the military chain of command as usual. So hierarchy, as we know, is very important in the military, as it is in BT and elsewhere, lots of other places. This is not a point about hierarchy in that sense. Because hierarchies are super useful. But in high tempo events or emergency events or punctuating events, um, or to use Ben's, Ben's language, um, dynamic events rather than enduring events, then the team switched into a different mode. They switched into a mode which didn't look at hierarchy, but switched into a mode which emphasized small network expertise, quick decision making. And that ability to switch between hierarchy and small networked expertise is one of the tricks that high, high reliability organizations can pull off. Okay? It does require, however, a workforce which is able to do that, okay? which we'll come to in a second. Come to in a second. So some other lessons from here. Again, these are drawn from some of the research we've done and also drawing on some of the kind of traditional research from other organizations. When we think about how we might get that kind of approach, if you look at, say, Agile, Agile talks all the time about cross-functional teams and leader-less organizations and so on and so on. All that's great. I'm sure you're very familiar with all that. If you check out four different levels, firstly, in other words, how are we going to make these kind of cross-boundary moves? First level is the leader level. Does the leader make the effort to, to, to move across different boundaries? That's the leader level. Do we have leaders like this? Secondly, intergroup level. Uh, research done in Novo Nordisk, um, you know, big, big Norwegian organization, utility, um, use facilitators, or as you would say in academia, network brokers, who would move between departments, <clears throat> who are knowledgeable about different departments, and who would move between and would have equal, um, legitimacy between the different groups. Third, at the professional level, um, again, a major IT, I can't, we can't name the company, alas, but major IT company has reliability professionals, again, who kind of champion these issues, making sure that small, weak signals are being brought to light early on. And last, at the object level, we have the boundary object issue. Where we have maps and dashboards and, you know, wargaming and all those kind of those kind of objects, which multiple people can interpret in multiple different ways. Um, classic example is Chasm in the, um, uh, it, you know, within BT, um, which, you know, is a way 
which was a kind of model which allowed people to, to kind of read off different things and to connect and to get behind um, a particular way of working within BT, which is which is very, very helpful, I think. Um, so a number of ways to think about this. To do is to think about how do we get the structure and the culture aligned, structure and culture aligned, to make sure that we have both, you know, we respect the hierarchy, but in, in you know, when when risks are happening, we can get people involved, and also that we have people who have internalised risk. I'll come to that point in one one second. Just for those of you, maybe just to refresh your memory about culture. Culture is at three, if you diagnose a culture, you tend to diagnose a culture at three levels. Artifact level, meaning the visible manifestation of the culture. Second level is the espoused values level, meaning the, the strategy, the policy, the mission, the values, etc. Underlying assumptions means what do people really think? So for example, if you see automation going on, um, you know, a broadband rollout or whatever it might be, you'll see, obviously see the artifacts, you'll see that. One of the questions is how are people interpreting those artifacts, just like automation, how are people interpreting these artifacts? Secondly, the espoused values. You know, we say we are a custom, you know, we're customer focused, we are, you know, we want to be very trustful, you know, the most trusted organization in the world, and so on. Well, that's fine. What do the underlying assumptions say about that? So one of the problems we have generally, not BT specifically, but generally, is is if we're going to change structure, strategy, culture, automation. Are we getting down to the underlying assumptions of what people, what people really think or believe? Okay. You know, as people say about agile, it's a mindset shift. You can change things, but will you get into the people's mindset? Okay. So we need to align all that stuff. We need to align all that stuff. So um, let me give you a little bit of narrative from the um, Spotlight event. So automation will, will mean, we'll bring up skilling. And some people will relish the chance to adopt more roles. Good, nice, positive view. Culture varies across the fan. Raising risks can be a, diff a different experience depending on where you are. Third, we work in a mesh. Then an issue goes up the tree. We don't necessarily have the resources to get people to fix problems. So sometimes when we think about culture, <clears throat> you know, people have these underlying assumptions that we need to Either we need to, we obviously need to surface them, and then we think, okay, how might we fix them? How can we get people to see more of the upside risk? How can we get people to see the benefits of some of the structures? Um, how can we do that? That's that's partly the key. Okay, one way to do that. Okay, and I'll this be the last point, and we'll open up for questions. Third point is stop talking about risk, <laughs> and that might make risk management better. What do we mean by that? We mean by this like this, really. Um, risk, pretty much like governance, is seen as a negative. I mean, again, when we had the, the Spotlight event, we put the flip chart up, we asked people their experiences of risk. Um, it was, you know, obviously, it was things that not necessarily good happening, which is, you know, if you ask me the same question, I would say the same thing. But in a way, we, that tends to make people shy away from it. Secondly, risk is, is usually associated with blame and with good reason. Because again, because many of us lack a systems view of the firm, it's very easy to point the finger at some operative or some person at the end of the chain who's, who's obviously seen to be made a mistake rather than track it back. And plus, blame makes us feel better because it's not us. So. Risk doesn't have happy connotations there either. Third point is some, some really interesting research about the presence of risk officers within firms, the introduction of risk officers within firms. Um, do they make risk better or do they make risk management worse? And the answer to that question, if you're interested in that study, we'll post it to you, but the answer to that question, they tend to make risk management worse. And the reason for that, surprise, surprise, is because if there are risk officers within the organization or risk committees or some big superstructure of risk with people with risk in their title, then people can offload the risk onto those people and they can breathe easy, safe in the knowledge that someone somewhere is dealing with this and I don't have to. And of course, the risk officers in a big organization 
can't deal with everything. And we know, we know that risk and governance depends on disclosure. But if people aren't disclosing, we're going to have a very difficult time. And the fourth thing is, there was a language issue around risk that we have to fix, just as a kind of combination of that. Again, from the, from the quotations, from the spotlight event, we need more real-time risk and the right people owning the risk. Right people here meaning the people on the front line. Secondly, how do I raise a risk is the wrong question. How do I deal with things and how do I do the right thing is what is needed. Also, we had a very interesting view about people who join the organization. New joiners tend to be told about, no, sorry, need to be told about this. What is a near miss? How can we develop our awareness? In other words, there's a socialization element here that we need to kind of get on top of. So again, these, these sorts are kind of in our minds. So just, just Put some takeaways and then we'll, we'll open it up for some questions. I, 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 you may have some thoughts about it. So the first, the first thought we had, the first theme we had was automation is the future, but people you know, frame it differently. And I guess one obvious answer here at the very high level is framing the automation narrative in a holistic way is the way to go. In other words, you know, let's be frank. You know, let's make sure that, you know, that people don't feel there's a hidden agenda, let's extol the benefits of this, let's extol the, the benefits for the customer and so on. One thing we do know about high reliability organizations is that the sense of mission and purpose is super high in these organizations, as it is in BT. So framing holistic narrative about automation for an organization like BT is probably much easier than it would be in other, I'm not saying it is easy, but I'm saying it's probably much easier than it would be in other firms because you have the overarching narrative about customer service and customer reliability and so on. Second point, customers, uh, sorry, culture doesn't always eat strategy or, or, you know, and structure for breakfast, for sure. Meaning, making risk about behaviors and to align with structures. Okay. So I know Ben in group risk is, is trying this and we've had a couple of very fruitful conversations with him and I think his work looks great. Um, and I think this is exactly the point. So in other words, can we get behaviors into everyday, into everyday, you know, operation? Um, let's reduce the cumbersome superstructure. Let's keep things simple and then socialize people for the culture. So when people walk in, you know, your apprentices or new hires or whatever, whatever level it might be, People understand about where the where the point the pain points or where the possibilities and opportunities might be. Third point: stop telling, stop talking about risk to make risk management better. And again, simplifying risk here is very important. Um, making things very very clear: we can't we can't control everything. Um, BT is a huge organization, so we have to simplify it. And we have to build it into the decision making process rather than on the reporting process. I'm sure BT, like most big organizations, have lots of you know checklists and committees and, and all that's you know fine, fine, fine. But again, the worry is it becomes slightly externalized. And what we need is have to build decision making into the fabric of individuals' day-to-day -day work. So in a nutshell, I hope, I hope that provides a, a, some food for thought for some questions and answers. Let me pause there. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen, for, for hosting and um, thank you all for, for coming. As Stephen said, please do get in touch if there's anything else you'd like. And I um, uh, uh, hope to see you again at a, at a different, different juncture. But uh, thanks a million, everyone.